Good morning. Glad everybody's joined us today, and welcome to our visitors. Glad that you're here. Um, we will have our announcements and regularly scheduled program here in just a second, but I have been asked to uh, lead a prayer for the Stevens family, a special prayer. And um, as you probably know, most of you know, uh, Jarrah Stevens, a longtime member, and um, her and her family, longtime members here at Centerville Road, and then have moved in the last five or six years to uh, California. She has been dealing with cancer for uh, ever since she left, and um, it looks like it's progressed uh, quite substantially at this point, and she is not in good health at this point, and uh, several of the members uh, have gone out to, to uh, see her and are flying actually right now to go see her and, and, the, and be with the family um, during this time, but we've been asked to, by the elders to lead a prayer, and I just pulled up a uh, a Facebook post that she sent and she's asked for four different things that we pray for so we'll try to get at least cover those things um, and and whatever else that uh, the Lord puts on my heart all right let's let's go to let's go to God in prayer our father in heaven we thank you so much for being so powerful such uh, so in control of our lives and of the world and father we know that you um, know our very our our every move and control our very being and and bring us into the world and and take us out and father we um, know that you know all things and you cause all things to work together for good to those who love you and are called according to your purposes and father we are strengthened by that and we have peace in our hearts and minds because of that and and because um, you are a supreme being and we don't have to worry about being in control, and we don't have to worry about uh, doctors and what they might do, um, Father, but we know that you um, are the ultimate uh, physician and can heal us and uh, can also bring us home to you when you so choose. And Father, we pray for the Stevens family at this time. We ask that you uh, be with Jera and her health, we ask that you be with this last chemo treatment that uh, she was uh, given on Thursday and that it be successful and that it start uh, killing the cancer that she does have. And Father, there's not very many that have hope of that happening, um, but we leave it in your hands and know that you can make that a reality if, if, it's, if you so choose and it be within your will. Father, we also pray for... Uh, Vince, her husband, and we ask that you be with him and help him to be a rock and to be strong during this time and, and help him to uh, be faithful to you and um, look to you for guidance and for direction, especially, Father, if things turn for the worse and Jera is no longer with him. Father, we also ask that you be with uh, Austin. We ask that you help him to, uh, to strengthen his his, be strengthened in his faith by this, but also that um, you help him to, to be a strength for his mother and his father and um, help him to understand uh, what is taking place and help him to understand that you are in control. And Father, we also pray for the girls, Anna and Katie, and we ask that you be with uh, them. And similarly, Father, help them to, um, to, to be able to face the challenges uh, that are coming, Father, and help them to um, to, to uh, be be trusting and, and and faithful to you as they grow up. And Father, if Jared leaves this earth, help help them and help uh, Austin to know that there was nothing more that that. Jera wanted them then to have faithful children and, and help them to be that, Father, and help us to help them be that. Father, we pray for those that are traveling today uh, to be with them, and uh, please help their journeys and help them to be of an encouragement and edification for the family. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ and what he's done in our life to save us from our sins so that we know and can, can be trusting that we will all be in heaven together with you uh, soon and one day. And Father, we ask that you help us to be ready as Jerry is to be called home. 
Thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for hearing our prayer today. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. few announcements before services begin and if you're visiting with us this morning we're certainly delighted that you've come our way we'd like an opportunity to meet you so please don't rush off after services we'd ask that you and our members fill out an attendance card. You'll find that on the back of the pew in front of you. And if you'd fill that out, those will be picked up at the end of services. As far as those that we need to remember in our prayers, we certainly want to continue to remember Jera and the Stevens family. There's also several in the newsletter that we need to be mindful of and continue to remember in our prayers. We have a note here that Norma Law, the sister of Emily Biggs, passed away early this morning. There have been no arrangements made as of yet. It says, please keep Emily in your prayers. After she fell yesterday while visiting her sister and family in Granbury, she was checked out and she has no broken bones. If you're a member of the Mickey Sandlin Evangelism Group, you'll be meeting this evening in the library to pick up your assignments. As far as meetings, uh, there will be a meeting this morning after worship in room 19 if you're willing to help with our upcoming door knocking campaign, which is set for July the 12th through the 19th. As far as other activities, the large involvement group will meet today for a potluck luncheon. That'll be in the multi-purpose room and visitors and new members are invited to join the group for a meal. As far as our order of worship this morning, our lesson will be brought by Ken Hope, will be led in our song service by Forrest Bomar. Alan Stevens will lead our opening prayer, and our scripture will be led by Alvin Opechi, and our closing prayer will be by Jim Tickner. So let's begin our service with a prayer at this time. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the day that we have today. Father, we thank you for each and every one that's gathered here together. Father, it's our intention today to bring glory and honor to you through our worship, Father, and we pray that you would accept our worship, that it would be pleasing to you, Father, that uh, we would each be edified by our fellowship together at this time. Father, I thank you for this church. Father, we pray that you would bless us in doing your will. Father, please bless our elders with wisdom and leading the congregation, watching over the flock. Pray that you would help us to be diligent in doing good spreading your word in this community and enlarging your kingdom. Father, we pray that you would thwart those throughout the world who would seek to do harm to your kingdom, whether by violence or by temptation or ridicule. Father, we pray that you would bless your people throughout the world. Father, we pray that you would uh, be with those that are ill. Father, we again ask that you would be with us Stephen's family. Please bless them. Father, we pray that you would be with Janice. She's battling cancer also. Father, we pray that you would be with Doris. Please grant them success, Father, in this. 
Father, we pray that you would grant them with remission from that. And Father, we pray that you would be with Mark and Randy as they uh, are strength to their wives and as they care for them. Please give them strength also. Father, there are many others, those that are, uh, have lost loved ones, suffering from sadness, suffering from illness. Father, the uh, age that slows us down and causes uh, concerns. Father, we pray that you would uh, be with each of these, strengthen them and comfort them, Father, and help us to be an encouragement to each other, to be a strength to each other, to, to lift each other up, Father, that uh, faith would remain strong and we would look to you for our source of strength and guidance. Father, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins, help us to look to you always. Father, we pray that you would get, grant us wisdom to know the things that we should do, to follow after your will, to be pleasing in your sight. It's through the name of Christ Jesus, our Savior, that we pray. Amen. Our scripture will be from Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death, passion fierce as the grave, its flashes are flashes of fire, a raging flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If one offered for love all the wealth of one's house, it would be utterly scorned. Our song this morning will be number five, A Hill Called Mount Calvary, number five. <clears throat> there are things as we travel this earth, shifting sands, that transcend all the reason of man. But the things that matter the most in this world, they can never be held in our hand. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. When time has surrendered and earth is no more, 
638. Six hundred thirty-eight. The Lord has been mindful of me. Though I through the valley of If you're able, please stand. I know that my Redeemer lives. Seven hundred eighty four. Why did my Savior come to earth? Seven hundred eighty four.
thankful for this opportunity of participating in this memorial service in which we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. Father, we're thankful for this bread which represents the body of our Savior. Dear Father, we're thankful for your love for us, your love for the world that led you to send your only son to this earth to live among us, to teach us, to show us how to live, and finally to die on our, in our behalf, to die the death that he didn't deserve, but that we deserve. Father, we pray that you'll help us to partake of this emblem in an appropriate manner. Help us always to remember that he died so that we could live. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. we continue. Most kind, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christ's precious blood. We know that unless we are, our sins are washed away in his blood, there would be no salvation for us. As we partake of this emblem, dear Lord, may we remember the blood that was shed for us on Christ, the cross. In Christ Amen.
will be number 23. All things are ready. Number 23. Now before the offering this morning, we'll sing number 780, number 438. My hope is built on nothing less. My, <clears throat> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Father in heaven, we ask your blessing today on those that are giving. Father, we pray your blessing on this gift, that it would be used to further your will. Father, we pray that you would help us to recognize all that you've given for us, and that we would follow in your example, Father, that we would avoid greed in our lives and be generous and known as a people who are willing to give and to sacrifice on your behalf. It's through Christ that we pray. Amen. Centerville Road. As you know, last, last week I was in a gospel endeavor in Morganton, Georgia. That is in the northern part of Georgia, close to the Tennessee and North Carolina border. And with the Eastside Congregation where Brother Roy Connor preaches. Roy's a former student at Brown Trail. Tyler knows him. Matthew knows him. And he's a good man. He's doing a good work in Georgia. Uh, you would have loved the setting, the countryside. It was beautiful. It was spectacular. So there were breathtaking views and we were among beloved brethren. 
Julie and Amanda went with me. Amanda has made new friends in Georgia. Now, Georgia, I would say, is a land flowing with milk and honey, and also it's a land full of zip lines. I brought Sister Anne Free some information that I'm sure she will cherish. She can add these zip lines to her, you know, repertoire. Well, as we get started, we have visitors with us. We're always grateful for those who are visiting. Uh, we, we trust that you will leave this place with something indeed profitable because we're studying together from God's Word. And God's Word has that promise attached to it. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. And so we want to encourage everyone to come back tonight. At 5 o'clock, what, what we're doing today, it's a, a two-fold lesson. We're actually presenting this morning what we presented Tuesday night of the gospel meeting. Brother Roy wanted me to focus upon the home and specifically marriage. And so every lesson we did in Georgia was concerning marriage. And on Tuesday night, we looked at the Song of Solomon and your marriage. I want us to think before we even enter this study. You know, the world's attitude towards marriage is obviously not what it should be. Our people, and when I say our people, I'm not talking so much about the church. It might be that too, but I'm talking about this country, our citizens, they marry, divorce, remarry with little or no regard whatsoever for God and his first institution. We need to remember at all times the language of Hebrews 13 and verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all men and the marriage bed be undefiled. For adulterers and whoremongers, God will judge. Malachi 2 and verse 16, God hates divorce. He always has. He always will. And in Jeremiah 44 in verse 4, I know in the specific context, it's not talking about divorce, but it can be applied to that. It's actually being talked about in that context about God's people being idolaters. But God sent the prophets, and here's what he said, Oh, do not do this abominable thing that I hate. Well, God hates divorce, and we need more saying, do not do this abominable thing that God hates. Well, how can we offset what's going on in our nation? I believe it's by one thing, preaching the word, letting people hear what God has to say about his first institution, Song of Solomon and your marriage. Let me read this quote. Paul Turnier said, it's quite clear that neither courses nor counseling will suffice in the face of our present widespread breakdown of marriage. We need a, mo a new moral contagion, one that brings about a change in deep-seated attitudes. Well, that, quote, moral contagion that can bring about a change in deep-seated attitude is nothing less than the Bible. That's what's going to do it. That's what's going to help us have the kind of attitude we ought to have towards marriage. And so, Song of Solomon and your marriage, make this that personal today. We're coming back at 5 o'clock and we're going to be looking at four things that you'll find within the Song of Solomon. You know, that little book is only eight chapters long. I would encourage you, please, to read it this afternoon. I haven't clocked it, I haven't timed it, but I'm suggesting it would take probably about 20 minutes of your time, and it would be a very profitable 20-minute investment. So challenge yourself to do that. Song of Solomon, read the book. You'll be better prepared to study with us tonight. What I want to do right now, I want us to look at some things that, these will pertain to the Song of Solomon. These are just bullet points. These will help us understand somewhat concerning this book. And so 
Go with me, Song of Solomon. Notice this first point. This book has been neglected and misunderstood. Even this morning, if you're sitting in the audience and you say, well, Ken, I've never read the Song of Solomon. Please, as I've said, read it. This one is, this book is neglected and misunderstood really by all of us. You know, to me, it's like the book of Revelation in the New Testament. We neglect it. We misunderstand it. Remember Hosea 4 and verse 6? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Let's not neglect any book of the Bible. Let's not misunderstand it. But if we neglect it, then we are going to misunderstand it. We're not going to understand its message, its focus, its thought. You remember in Matthew 22 and verse 29, you do greatly err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Really, the greatest mistake we can make in life is not knowing God's word. His word is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. Psalm 119, verse 105. And so if we do not know it or if we will not live according to it, then we are just traveling in the dark. We have no light to our feet, no lamp for our path, we're just living in darkness. But this book has been neglected, misunderstood. It has been the subject of a very fanciful, a very fanciful interpretation. Now again, I think these two points go hand in hand. Since it's been neglected, since it is misunderstood, there are going to be interpretations attached to it that, that are simply not right. They're altogether wrong. You remember in 2 Peter, the first chapter, verses 20 and 21, no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own private interpretation. In verse 21, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The point in that context that Peter is making is that when God gave the prophets, the inspired men, his word, it wasn't up to them having received it to say, well, this is what I think it means. Think about the dreams and the visions that are, you know, replete in the Old Testament. When the prophets received that, they didn't say, well, you know, here's the vision I was given, and so I'll just make up something. No, it's of no private interpretation. And so, again, the same thing is true concerning Song of Solomon. We're not to read this book and say, well, then, here's what I think it might be saying. That's how some approach it. That's how some view it. Catholicism says that the Song of Solomon is God's love towards the Virgin Mary. Well, you can't find any hint of that whatsoever in the book Song of Solomon. Others have said it's God's love for Israel. Others have said it's Christ's love for the church. Now, it's true that God loved Israel. I've loved you with an everlasting love, Jeremiah 31 and verse 3. And it's true that Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, Ephesians 5 and verse 25. But again, read Song of Solomon, and unless you want to interject that thought, it's simply not there. And so let's be a better student. Let's read it more often. Let's consider it in its context. Again, the Jews considered this book uniquely sublime. They said that the book of Proverbs was like the outer court of the temple. And they said that Ecclesiastes represented the holy place. And that the Song of Solomon represented the holy of holies. Now that's just showing the respect that they had for this book. And brethren, that is the respect that we need to have for every word of God. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, Matthew 4 and verse 4. Likewise, it's also known as the Song of Songs. If you have your Bibles with you, Turn with me to Song of Solomon. I just want us to read right now verse 1 of chapter 1. Again, remember this point. It's also known as the Song of Songs. That preposition of 
It is used here as a superlative. And so of all the songs, this one is the best. This, we, we could use it like this in Revelation 19 and verse 16 and also Revelation 17 and verse 14. You remember in that context, it's speaking concerning Jesus, that he is king of kings and he is Lord of lords. Of all the lords that there are on this earth, Jesus is Lord of them. Of all the kings, he is king of them. And so with that in mind, this preposition, this superlative, look what it says. Uh, Song of Solomon chapter 1 and verse 1, the song of songs, which is Solomon's. And so just like Jesus is the king of kings, this is the song of songs. Think with me, this next point goes hand in hand with what we've just said. Thus, it's Solomon's best or most important. Again, this is the best of the best. This is the song of songs. Write down 1 Kings 4 and verse 32. What makes this quite important is... In 1 Kings 4, in verse 32, you find out that Solomon wrote 3,000 proverbs and 1,005 songs. That's a lot of songs. I haven't written in my lifetime one song. Solomon wrote 1,005 songs. And out of those 1,005 songs, this, he says, is the song of songs. Solomon says this is the best. Consider with me again. It is a true love song. That's what the song of songs is. That's what the song of Solomon is. It is a true love song. Now I'm showing my age here and Tyler likes that when I, when I do that. But B.J. Thomas years ago, he said... You know, oh, won't you sing another somebody done somebody wrong song. I think if I put it to the tune, you wouldn't recognize it. But, but you remember probably that song. Won't you sing another somebody done somebody wrong song. It's a country western song. That's what's happening in most of those songs. Well, Song of Solomon, someone hasn't done somebody wrong. These two love each other. They are living right before each other. They care about each other immensely, deeply. This is a true love song. Uh, It's a celebration of human affection. You remember in Genesis, the first chapter, verses 26 and 27, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And you remember at the end of verse 27, male and female created he them. Well, male and female, God created. And remember in Genesis 2, when we see this a little bit better, because God says it's not good for man to be alone, Genesis 2, 18. He's going to make a help meet. He does that. He causes a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. He removes a rib from Adam's side, closes up the flesh at that place. From that rib, he forms Eve He brings woman before Adam. And remember Adam's response. Again, it's a celebration of human affection. This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken from man. And for this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That is what you're seeing in the book, Song of Solomon. It's a celebration of human affection. Likewise, within her pages, we see and learn the strength of enduring devotion. These two, the Shulamite, the beloved, those are the main characters in the Song of Solomon. You'll also see the daughters of Jerusalem, You'll also see Solomon's friends. You'll also see the Shulamites' brothers. But these two are the main characters, and these two are devoted to one another. 
I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. Song of Solomon 6 and verse 3. And the book, it, it nearly ends with this refrain. In Song of Solomon 8 and verse 7, Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. What you're seeing in Song of Solomon is love tried and love triumphant. Again, we see the strength of enduring devotion. And notice this, it exalts the beauty and the intimacy of married love. The beauty and the intimacy of married love. To me, write down Proverbs 5, verses 18 and 19. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. Be always exhilarated in her love. That's part of what those verses say. Well, to me, the Song of Solomon just begins there and, and shows us that. It shows us the beloved rejoicing with the wife of his youth. And they're always intoxicated. Not only he intoxicated, exhilarated in her love, she is likewise. Again, they love each other dearly. You remember in Genesis 3 and verse 16, sin has entered the world, and God tells Eve, now listen to this, that your desire will be for him, your husband. Your desire shall be for your husband. That's normal. That's natural. Well, when you go to the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 24 and verse 16, we read there that with one stroke, God tells Ezekiel, I'm going to remove the desire of your eyes. Well, if you only read Ezekiel 24 and verse 16, you really don't know what the desire of Ezekiel's eyes are because that's all we're told. I'm going to remove with one stroke the desire of your eyes. Two verses later, it was evening and Ezekiel's wife died. That's a precious context. What, who was the desire of Ezekiel's eyes? His wife. And friend, that's the way it ought to be in marriage. Her desire should be for her husband. Her husband's desire should be for her. The desire of your eyes. Well, look at this. Now, this is as far as we'll have this morning. Look at these next two points. Solomon slays two moral Goliaths. I'm talking about through the book, Song of Solomon. Solomon slays two moral Goliaths. David, his father, slayed a physical Goliath. That was the giant from Gath. That was his name, Goliath. We all remember that. Well, Solomon, in Song of Solomon, is slaying two moral Goliaths, two moral giants, and these are extremes. These extremes are not helping the marriage. These extremes are hurting the institution of marriage. Here's the first extreme, immorality or lust. This view suggests that love and marriage is nothing more than a sensuous or erotic affair. That's how some view marriage. That this just, quote, makes it legal. The it is intimacy or sex. And to them, that's all that marriage is. It's just about sex. Well, marriage involves intimacy. It certainly does. That's God's plan. But it's more than intimacy. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6 and verse 25? Life is more than food and the body than clothing. Jesus didn't deny that life is food. He understood that. Jesus didn't deny that the body is for clothing. But it was more than that. And, and marriage is for intimacy, but it's more than intimacy. You remember in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 2, to avoid sexual immorality, let every woman have her own husband and every man have her, his own wife. God's plan is, he, he's the one that made us with passions and desires. 
Remember, human sexuality was his idea, not our idea. He made them male and female. But God also said, here's where you can experience the intimacy, the sexual delight. Here's the realm where you can experience it, and it's in marriage. To avoid immorality, let every woman have her own husband and every man have his own wife. Earlier in 1 Corinthians 6, what did Paul say? The body is not for immorality, but the body is for the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 13. And in verse 18, he says, flee immorality. And so it's God's idea. Yes, human sexuality, male and female. It's a reality. It's God's idea and we toy with it, we play with it, we abuse it as if it's nothing. And this is what's hurting so many marriages today. Immorality, lust. You know, when the world talks about love, they don't even understand what love is. Really, most of the time when the world is speaking about love, what they really mean is lust. That's about it. I love her. Well, I lust after her. Or I love him. No, I lust after him. Let marriage be held in honor among all men. And the marriage bed be undefiled. For adulterers and whoremongers, God will judge. You know that term honor? It means consider it dear. It means place a value upon marriage. That's what you do. That's what I should do. And the term defile, it means to pollute or besmear with mud. It's talking about don't drag marriage through the mud. You honor marriage. You exalt marriage. And those who do defile the marriage bed. God simply says, I will judge. Those, friend, are haunting words because it's impossible for God to lie. Hebrews 6 and verse 18, he's not telling us a lie. He's telling us the truth. I'll judge. This is my institution. And he's saying you are privileged to enter this institution. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Matthew 19 and verse 6. But if you enter my institution and if you defile it, he says, rest assured, I will judge you for that. And so Solomon in his book, he slays this moral Goliath, this vast extreme. Here's the extreme that, that that's all marriage is good for. That's all marriage is. It's just intimacy. Well, the other extreme, asceticism. This view denies the beauty, legitimacy, and essential goodness of the physical union between husband and wife. This is when people bring into marriage this concept that sex and intimacy is inherently evil. And so they do not fulfill their responsibilities to their wife or their husband as they ought. Remember what we're talking about. Human sexuality, we didn't invent it. We didn't come up with it. God made us male and female. And God placed the intimacy within his institution of marriage. Within marriage, it's right. It's good. It's holy. Outside of marriage, it's wrong. The intimacy, the sexual activity that we see in our society today, so rampant, it's wrong outside of marriage. Think about this. In Genesis, the first chapter, Genesis, the first chapter, God reviews and looks at his work, and every time he says, it is good. In fact, the seventh time in chapter 1 and verse 31, he says, it's very good. Now that's important because when God reviews everything he's done, he says, it's good. He places his stamp of approval on it. Well, within Genesis 1, that's where God made them male and female, man and woman. Thus, human sexuality, when God looked at what he did, he says, it's good. It is very good. 
within marriage. Again, the sexual union is right. It is to be enjoyed. It is to be experienced. Outside of marriage, it's wrong. It's sinful. I've said this before from this pulpit, but listen to this. To me, it really helps us to understand what we're dealing with right now. This, this is a broad, broad subject, the subject of lust or immorality. But I think you can condense it somewhat by just simply realizing there are only two sexual sins. Only two sexual sins. And you say, well, Kim, I just don't know about that because there's this and there's this and, and, and we have everything going on. Listen to this. Two sexual sins. The first one, giving yourself intimately, sexually to the wrong person. And the wrong person is anyone that is not your lawful husband or your lawful wife. That covers all of the perversion it covers all the immorality, giving yourself intimately to the wrong person. The second sexual sin, and we don't talk about this like we should. The second one, though, is withholding yourself from the right person. And I'm talking intimately. The wife says, no, we're not going to have any more intimacy. Or the husband, for whatever reason, we're not going to have intimacy. We have to go back to Scripture, 1 Corinthians 7, after Paul tells them to avoid immorality, let every woman have her own husband, every man have his own wife. He goes on to show you stop defrauding one another. You can't withhold yourself from one another. And he goes on to make it so plain, he said the wife, the wife doesn't have authority over her own body, the husband does. And he doesn't stop there. The husband doesn't have authority over his own body. The wife does. And so he says, stop defrauding each other. Stop withholding from one another. Now he does give the option, if there is a problem and there is a mutual consent to separate for a time, and notice it's to devote yourself to prayer and fasting. This is not let's just some, take some time off from marriage. No, this is our marriage means so much. We've got a problem. We want to get it back right. Let's devote ourselves in this time of separation to prayer and fasting. But he says, come together again, lest Satan tempt you through your lack of self-control. He says, this time should be agreed upon, and it's not forever. And it's a spiritual purpose behind it to strengthen your marriage, but you come back together. Why? Because, again, God put these passions within us, and they can be experienced within marriage. Song of Solomon. Again, please, this afternoon, do yourself a favor and do your marriage a favor. Read the Song of Solomon. We're going to show the joy within that book because this couple does four different things. You might jot down what you think it is. What is this couple doing in Song of Solomon that restores joy and retains the joy within their home? Very needed study. As we turn our attention, we're, we're through this morning. But you know, as we've talked and as we've looked into God's Word and as we've considered spiritual truths, if your marriage is not what it used to be, then do all within your power to restore the joy that your marriage once had. Restore that first love. Remember what Jesus in Revelation 2-4 says to his bride, the church at Ephesus? Notwithstanding, I have something against you. You've left your first love. If you've left the intensity of love, the love you had for each other, when you first came together, when you were dating, your first years of marriage, then that can be restored. How do I do that, Ken? You remember from whence you have fallen, Revelation 2 and verse 5, and repent and do the first works, do the deeds you did at first. 
get back to doing what you once did when you were showing her, when you were showing him that you cared, that you loved him or her. On a broader scale, I want you to think about this. If Christ and Christianity is no longer your fervent love, not like it was, not like he was when you first obeyed his gospel. You know what? That joy can be restored too. David says in, in Psalm 51 and verse 12, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Salvation comes with joy. You can't separate those two. When the eunuch obeyed what Philip had taught him, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He went on his way rejoicing. Acts 8 and verse 39. Now, as we go on our way rejoicing, having obeyed the Christ, over time, if something happens to that, and you say, well, you know, I just don't have that same joy. Well, again, let's pray what David prayed. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Let's get back to the realization. Happy are the people who are so situated. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Psalm 145 and verse 15, that can take place, and it will. When we leave sin, when we look at our lives and we say, you know what, I could be in the Father's household, but I'm in the pig's pen. I'm in life's pig's pen now, Luke 15, and I don't want to stay here. I don't want to be here. I'll go back to my father. I'll say, I've sinned in heaven's sight, in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The prodigal thought about saying, make me as one of your hired men. The father wouldn't hear those words because our father is willing to receive us. Our father is willing and ready to forgive us. God is good and ready to forgive. Psalm 86 and verse 5. So what the father said, he didn't say, son, I'll, I'll take you back as a hired man. He said, no, bring out the best robe. Bring out the ring. Bring out the sandals. These are emblematic of a relationship. He says, I'm bringing you back into this household as a beloved son. I will forgive. Beautiful story. The story of Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's one of redemption for us. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of his glory, Romans 3 and verse 23. But we can all be forgiven. We can all be received if we'll but obey Christ Jesus our Lord. He's the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. If you need to study with someone about what do I do to obey the Christ, let us know that today. If you know what you ought to do and you just haven't done it, let's do that today. And for those of us who have known and, and we've done it, if we've slipped, if we've drifted away, let's get back to that fervent love that we once had. Let's start walking again. Let's, let's not drift as Hebrews the second chapter and verse one says. Let's draw near to God and he'll draw near to us. James four, verses seven and eight. If you have a need to come, won't you as we stand together and as we sing?